Mike Brown, the former FEMA director. Joining us here is the former FEMA director. History, I think, was very unkind to you, my friend. Very unkind. Mr. Brown, thanks for being with us. This is Michael Brown Unplugged. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Michael Brown Unplugged. Glad to have you with me. I wanted to start uh, start off by talking about someone sent me a link that they had seen on Facebook, and it's to a YouTube video. It's an hour long, and it is called Seattle is Dying. Seattle is Dying. Now, I don't expect you to watch the entire one hour, but I want to talk about this video, this documentary that was done by KOMO uh, Television. It's an ABC affiliate out of Seattle in which they talk about the homeless, the homelessness problem, the drug problem, the crime problem, all within King County, which is the home of Seattle. And as I watched this video, I was struck by a lot of things that I want to talk about. Let's first talk about the homelessness problem in Seattle because it's similar to the homelessness problem that we have in probably every major American city. But it builds on something that I talked about yesterday. Do you remember when I talked about we were going to eliminate crimes of need? That Dallas, Dallas, Texas, has decided that certain misdemeanors were no longer going to be prosecuted. So if a cop, let's say that somebody breaks into your house and steals a piece of property from you that is worth less than $750, even though there is a crime committed, a burglary, they have stolen property that belongs to you, stealing, if that property is worth less than $750, The prosecutors in Dallas County, or I guess to be more specific, the prosecutors in the city of Dallas are not going to prosecute those crimes. So that is in essence just giving, that that is announcing to every dirtbag, to every thug out there, that if you want to break into somebody's house and steal property and it's worth less than $750, you're not going to be prosecuted. Now, to be fair and to try to be objective about the story, they also added that you have to show that you needed the property. Now, I don't know. I mean, someone breaks into my house and steals, I don't know, I, I, as I'm looking in my studio, the uh, the wine rack is over there. And I don't know, maybe there's $750 worth of wine in those racks. Probably so. There is a big screen television over there. The price of big screen TVs, if you've been to Sam's Club lately, you see the big screen TVs, you can get them as less, you can get them for as little as $350 or $500. So they walk out with a big screen TV. Now, I don't know what their need might be, but if they can show that they have a need for that big screen TV, no prosecution. Or take it to the retail level. Because going back to Seattle is Dying, this documentary that I spent an hour watching, I can't believe that I spent an hour watching it, but I'm glad that I did. And if you have an hour, I would encourage you to watch it also. Because in one little graphic they show, in terms of the amount of crimes that are being committed by homeless people, drug addicts and other people on the streets, at the, at the top of the scale is obviously San Francisco. And then right behind San Francisco was Seattle. But if you watch closely, because I'm looking to see where Denver fits into that graphic, Denver fits in probably in the uh, top one-third. The point being that probably every major city, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, Sacramento, San Diego, uh, Los Angeles, Houston, Dallas, Austin, Denver, uh, Kansas City, Uh, Probably to some degree, if you go to uh, New Orleans, obviously, Miami-Dade County, every, every major city that you can think of, I think this documentary applies to those major cities. Now, part of the theory, part of the problem as I watched this documentary was that there is no law enforcement. Law enforcement in Seattle has just given up. 
there were statistics showing they took the top 100 individuals that had the most number of crimes committed. And that all in those top 100, you might have somebody that over the course of four years had been arrested 60 times. Catch and release. They get arrested for uh, trespassing. They get arrested for drug use. They get address, uh, arrested for dealing. They get arrested for theft, robbery, any number of things, and they just get released. And so just these top 100 people that some – I mean, bless his soul, some individual decided to actually dig into the police reports and see what was going on. These top 100 people, now, they're obviously committing most of the crimes, but the list is much, much longer than 100 people. The point of the, of the, of the study of collecting all these statistics was showing that Seattle had adopted a similar policy to that of what I talked about yesterday in Dallas, where you're not going to prosecute these misdemeanor crimes like trespassing and theft. One of the examples that really stuck out with me where you've seen where these mobs of teenagers will run into, they'll go into a mall, and then they will just ransack a store and leave. And because there's so many of them, the, the shop owner is helpless to do anything. And then, of course, they they disperse into the parking lot and they get in their cars and they've gone to the Gap, they've gone to whatever the retail store is, and they've gathered up as much merchandise as they can and they've run off and they'll never be prosecuted. Now, I get that that type of crime is difficult to prosecute and enforce because you have a mob and, once again, understanding that the cops have no constitutional responsibility to enforce the laws because you can't protect everybody. What I watched in a couple of videos were these individuals that would walk into a retail store in downtown Seattle and just grab up merchandise. One individual, so it's not the mob, or it's not a mob, I should, I should say, to be more specific. And just gather up as much merchandise as they can and run out the store. One shop owner finally gave up, moved her shop to Bellevue, Washington, instead of Seattle. And her store is thriving. But she had to leave because of the constant theft, no prosecution of those thefts, the urine and the feces and the trash and the tents and the garbage and everything else that was piling up outside her store, and law enforcement was nowhere to be seen. Now, before you think I'm banging on the cops, they also did, they they couldn't get any cops to go on record. So they did an anonymous questionnaire. And holy cow, if you read what the cops say, and they interviewed one cop who finally agreed to go on camera who just resigned he just he just quit being a cop bought a farm and left and he described how he thought initially he was doing good work he was protecting people he was enforcing the law he was helping the downtown area be a safe place for tourists and and shop owners and business owners and and just Workers that, you know, if you've never been to downtown Seattle, it really is, or at least it used to be. It's been probably 10 years since I've been in Seattle, and based on this story, I have no desire to go to Seattle. It reminded me of the broken windows theory. The broken windows theory is, is, a, is a theory of criminology, that visible signs of crime or antisocial behavior, civil disorder, All of those things, if they are not enforced and stopped, that they create an urban environment that encourages even more crime and even more disorder, and that ultimately leads to even more serious crimes. Now, that theory was introduced in a a, uh, scholarly article back in the 1980s, but it was popularized in the 1990s when New York City Police Commissioner uh, Bratton and newly elected Mayor Rudy Giuliani 
started using policing policies that were influenced by this theory. And their theory was, if you let the smallest things go, those continue to grow larger and larger. And I think that's what we're seeing in Seattle. That's what we're seeing in Denver. That's what we'll see in Dallas and Houston and all these other places. So I'm going to go back for just a moment to the story that I did yesterday about Dallas and not enforcing the crimes. Because that's what's going on in Seattle. They interviewed one guy who was quite proud of the fact that he was on this list of 100 most uh, prominent criminals. He was proud of that fact. And he talked about his addiction to methamphetamines. And he talked about how he has now gravitated towards stealing to support his habit. And he was proud of that. Because now he's able to go steal from shop owners or tourists or anybody else without fear of prosecution, without fear of arrest, to support his drug habit. And on camera, he, he proudly talks about being able to do that without any consequences. Those are the progressive mindset that think that Uh, For example, in Denver, where they are voting, I'm I'm not a resident of Denver, but Denver has this proposition, Proposition 300, and it's, um, in the vernacular, it is a right to rest, a right to sleep, and if it passes, it will allow people to pretty much put up a tent, sleep whenever, whenever, wherever they want to. And the city and county of Denver won't enforce any trespassing laws. We're only one step away from doing something like Dallas did of saying that not only can you just sleep, urinate, and defecate wherever you want to, you can trespass wherever you want to. But the next step is what Dallas did of saying, and we're not going to enforce any of these laws if you you steal something and it's worth less than $750 and you can show that you needed those diapers you needed that big screen TV because you're poor and you needed to you needed to steal Michael Brown's big screen TV because you can go pawn it, you can go sell it on the street, and you can make 50 bucks, and that's enough to go buy enough heroin or methamphetamines or whatever it is so that you don't have to, uh, so that you can support your habit. All of these things put together, the crime in Seattle, the lack of law enforcement in Seattle, the decision to not prosecute crimes both in Seattle and Dallas, things like the proposition in Denver where you can just sleep, poop, and pee wherever you want to. That is the mindset of those on the left who do not believe that people should be held accountable for their actions. And that is leading to a breakdown of American society. I know this is a downer topic, but I want you to be aware, and I want you to think about and be aware of this idea that if you are compassionate, because that's what I heard throughout this story about Seattle, was that the city, the, the city council wanted to be compassionate. Compassionate does not mean that you do not hold people accountable for their criminal activity. In fact, at the end of the documentary, they go to Providence, Rhode Island, where they started strictly enforcing the laws, almost a broken windows theory of law enforcement in Providence, Rhode Island. But once they got the people in jail, particularly the drug addicts, they started with a drug treatment program, methadone and and uh, vitri. I want to say vitriol, but that was viva viv, vivitrol or something. There's three. There, there were three. One starts with an O, but there were three drugs that helped people break their opioid and opiate addiction. And they started doing this, and then they started tracking the success rate once these people left prison. Do you know that in Providence, Rhode Island, they have a 93% success rate? I think that's compassion. They're arresting people. They're throwing them in jail. 
But once they're in jail, they are given the opportunity. Now, they don't have to do it. But once they have been taken off the streets and they've been taken out of those circumstances, they are given the opportunity to now go on to this, it's called a MATS program, M-A-T-S, and I don't remember what it stands for. But once they go in this program and they serve their time, they leave prison, Providence, Rhode Island is experiencing a 93% success rate that these people do not go back to heroin, methamphetamines, or, or opioids, or whatever it is that they were addicted to. That's compassion. Law enforcement. Holding people accountable. So the next time you, and, and again, you can find the documentary on YouTube if you want to take the time to watch it. Seattle is dying. And I want to make one last point about it before I move on. It's been viewed three point, last, last I looked, three point some million views of this video. Thousands of comments. But the point that I think some people glossed over, this is a documentary done by a local news station that is trying to hold their city council and their kind of non-compassionate policies of not enforcing the law, trying to hold that city council and that city government accountable. That's Pulitzer Prize winning material, in my opinion. Seattle is dying. It shows that this progressive policy of not enforcing the law, of trying to feel sorry for people, of not holding them accountable, doesn't work. And is destroying American civilization. It is, it is destroying the very fabric of American cities. And I would say it doesn't have to be big cities. It can be small cities too. And on top of that, it's actually good journalism. Journalism that, in my opinion, ought to win a Pulitzer Prize. So, in summary, the YouTube, the documentary is called Seattle is Dying. It ties back to the whole idea that lack of law enforcement, like they want to do in Dallas and like they're attempting to do in Denver, is going to further break down American society. And there are ways of being compassionate while you still hold people accountable, something that we have got to face in this country. For those, of you, for those of you that listen to the radio program, you know I used to do something called taxpayer relief shots. And I want to introduce this uh, podcast audience to the taxpayer relief shot. And let me describe what it is. You see, the, the Second Amendment as a – hang on. Let me just uh, – you know, I used to do this on air all the time. Let me pull it up because I want to read it verbatim because even though I can read it verbatim from memory, I want to read it directly from – hear that? My little constitution I keep with me everywhere. The Second Amendment reads – A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, if you've you've ever read the Heller decision in an incredible historical overview by Justice Scalia, you'll know that the interpretation of the Second Amendment by the U.S. Supreme Court is that it is an individual right. I have an individual right to keep and bear arms. And historically, that purpose of me having an individual right to keep and bear arms is that we need, and at the time, a well-regulated militia, was the general population. The general population needed to be armed because that was necessary to the security of a free state. And if you don't believe me that that's true, go read the Heller decision or just look at today's news of what's going on in Venezuela, where finally there may be an armed uprising and the military may be turning on Nicolas Maduro. And the people could have done that earlier, but for the fact that they didn't have a Second Amendment. So the Second Amendment is is honestly about two things. One, my individual right to keep and bear arms. And two, that the founders believed that it was necessary for me to be able to keep and bear arms and that that right should not be infringed because that was necessary to secure 
a free state in which to live in order for us to protect ourselves against a tyrannical government. But what you don't hear me say about the Second Amendment is that the founders believed that it was necessary for self-defense. Now, you may make an argument that it was necessary for self-defense against a tyrannical government, but I want to talk about the natural law of self-defense. The natural law, the God-given law, that each of us has a right to secure our bodies, ourselves, and to secure our property, to secure our families against people who would do us harm. That's another aspect of the individual right to keep and bear arms, the right of self-defense. So oftentimes, more often than not, you hear the story about a cop that either legitimately or illegally uses his service weapon to kill an individual, either in self-defense or because he believes that there is a fleeing felon and the only way that he can stop this fleeing felon from attacking himself or others is to shoot him. Sometimes those are justified. Sometimes they're not. But those are the kinds of stories that always make the news. What we rarely hear about are the individuals like you that find yourself in in a dangerous situation where you exercise your right of self-defense. We call those the taxpayer relief shots. And the reason I call them taxpayer relief shots is, let's walk through it. You're at home, or you're in your business. Your business is a convenience store. Kind of a stereotypical example. And a thug decides that he either wants to break into your home, or he wants to rob you in your convenience store. But you, exercising your individual right to keep and bear arms, you have a gun with you. So that when someone breaks through your front door, before you know whether they are, well, someone breaks through your front door, I think it's a safe assumption that they are there to do you harm. And so if they're coming in to steal from you, rape your wife, harm your children, whatever it is, if you exercise your right of self-defense, or in the case of a convenience store owner, a thug walks in points a gun at your head, demands money or product or whatever it is, and you're able to reach under the counter or reach into your waistband and pull your weapon and shoot the thug in self-defense, those are taxpayer relief shots. And we call them taxpayer relief shots because you have now saved the taxpayers. Now, there is the embedded cost of the cops doing doing an investigation. They come to your home to investigate the shooting and the robbery. They go to the convenience store to investigate the shooting and the robbery. But those are embedded costs because the cops are there regardless of whether a crime is committed or not, just as the courts are there. But here's the difference. If you shoot that thug in a lawful self-defense situation, either in your home or your convenience store, You save the taxpayers the cost of a trial, the cost of the public defender, because most thugs end up having to use a public defender. You save the cost of the incarceration while the thug is going to trial. You then save the cost of incarceration once the thug is making the assumption that the thug is legitimately convicted of armed robbery or breaking and entering or whatever it is, some unlawful criminal activity and then is going to have to go spend jail time, you save the taxpayers the cost of that. So we call them taxpayer relief shots. And we like to celebrate that because we're not celebrating, let me emphasize, we are not celebrating the thug who is killed. We're not celebrating the death or the killing of another individual. What we are doing is we are celebrating the exercise of the right of self-defense. Because if we don't do that, If we don't point out legitimate uses of self-defense, pretty soon that God-given right is going to be taken away. So let's do some taxpayer relief shots quickly. 
The first one comes to us from Atlanta, Georgia. It goes like this. It's a great place to stay. Just need a little patrol. The call to 911 came around 2.30 this morning. Investigators say the man inside this home believed several intruders were making their way into his home from a backyard window. Initially, he thought there was at least maybe two or even possibly three suspects. So far, the investigation's proving that not to be true. It, it just appears to be one, one suspect. Uh, that acted alone at this time. King County Sheriff's deputies say the 35-year-old homeowner, while on the phone to 911, opened fire with a gun, killing the intruder. So far, investigators believe in this case, the homeowner was within his right to defend himself. You have every right to protect yourself and your family if you're in fear for your life or your safety. Uh, and it appears that's what happened in this instance, at least so far. Good in the daytime, nighttime is not good. Dale Meadows and several others living in this White Center neighborhood tell Q13 News that burglaries and property crime are a troubling issue. I don't know what it's about over here. It's just a magnet to trouble. While the investigation is ongoing, the suspect in any criminal history is yet to be released by the sheriff's office. Meanwhile, some in this neighborhood who already feel uneasy about crime wonder how the homeowner must feel after having to take a life to defend himself. Well, of course, the homeowner is not happy about having to uh, take the life of somebody to defend himself. Who would be? Of course, you're not going to be happy about doing that. That's, again, because that's not what we're celebrating. What we are celebrating is the fact that this homeowner, using his God-given right of self-defense, was able to protect himself and his family from an intruder who was there to do him harm And thus, by protecting himself and his family, you have a taxpayer relief shot. I want to thank Joe, who sends those to me regularly, and we'll try to intersperse taxpayer relief shots into the podcast, because again, I think it's important for us just to take the time to celebrate the idea that the Second Amendment, while indeed it is an individual right to keep and bear arms, and it was designed to keep the population armed, in order to ensure a free state, it is also, in in some ways, an embodiment of that natural God-given right of self-defense. And I think we need to take time out to celebrate that when it's appropriate. And that's a taxpayer relief shot. Along the lines of a taxpayer relief shot, I want to talk for a moment about the National Rifle Association. Because there's a lot of stories in the news about the fact that Oliver North got into a fight with Wayne LaPierre, the executive vice president, the executive director of the National Rifle Association. And there's a lot of talk about uh, infighting within the NRA. But I want to set that aside for a moment because I think we're missing the larger story. After the shooting in the synagogue, Democrats were quick to reiterate their support for incremental measures that, in fact, repeal our Second Amendment rights to bear arms. The first civil right and the first line of defense in support of liberty against tyranny is the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is the palladium of the liberties of the republic, and as such, a primary target for leftists who constantly endeavor to, to, to erode our liberties wherever they can. Whether it's the First Amendment, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, they are constantly trying to erode those basic liberties contained in the Bill of Rights. Senator Kamala Harris, the Democrat from California, the former Attorney General running for president, she took the lead on this liberty assault. She has founded her campaign on gun control measures and declared that, quote, we need leaders in Washington, D.C. who have the courage to speak the truth. Upon being elected, I will give Congress 100 days to get their act together and have the courage to pass reasonable gun safety laws, and if they fail to do it, then I will take executive action. Now, I'm really curious about what executive action she can take that somehow she thinks is constitutional if it somehow infringes infringes on my right to keep and bear arms. But you know, every time a Democrat says speak the truth or reasonable gun safety laws or common sense gun safety legislation, your ears should perk up and you ought to pay attention. Now, I think most of us can agree that some laws, some laws 
regulating firearm sales and possession are necessary in a society. But when I say some laws, there are now about 25,000. 25,000 federal, state, and local gun laws in the books, none of which are going to complete or are going to prevent a social path in a synagogue or an urban center from killing people. But the Democrats' political agenda is about constricting the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens. You see, I think they see us, who are law-abiding gun owners, as a threat to unmitigated central government power. Now, what does that have to do with the NRA? The NRA, while there are many organizations that work and advocate to protect our Second Amendment from the encroachment by the left, it's had a difficult convention. President Trump addressed the NRA convention attendees, and he used the opportunity to announce that He was pulling the United States signature from the United Nations Arms Trade Treaty. But the domestic assault on liberty is much more formidable than that from foreign threats. And that's what I want to help all of us understand. New York and California are using the power of the state to undermine the NRA. They are attempting to restrict its legal status and press it ever deeper into debt with legal costs. Now, framing the left's objective, Governor Cuomo of New York says, quote, the NRA's goal is to sell more guns, and they don't care if they sell them to legal owners or to illegal owners. They just want to sell more guns, end quote. Now, you and I know that's a blatant lie. It's a lie on every level. But for those on the left... The truth is whether is, is actually just whatever they define it to be. Wayne LaPierre, the CEO, the executive vice president of the NRA, summed up Cuomo's agenda in remarks to NRA members. He said, the governor wants you and wants your organization, the NRA, denied financial services. Simply put, The governor wants the NRA blacklisted. Wayne LaPierre, whether you agree with how he runs the organization or not, is immaterial to this discussion. The external challenges to the Second Amendment and the external challenges to the NRA come in a week when that organization is facing internal strife as many organizations do when they start getting attacked from all of these outside organizations. I don't care about the internal disputes. What I care about is this. When government starts using the power of the state to try to destroy a legitimate, lawful, nonprofit organization, a trade association, or anybody else that is no different than the use of the IRS to deny 501c3 tax tax exempt status to a legitimate organization. That is trying to shut down speech. That is trying to shut down lawful activities. And it is using the power of the government to do so. And you should fear that with every ounce of your being. If the government can go after the NRA and try to somehow deny them their existence by threatening credit card issuers, insurance companies, rental car companies, I'm just trying to think out loud of every single benefit that is offered by the NRA. Now, I'm not a member of the NRA. I I choose instead to put my money in other organizations. But I want you to think about any or you know any organizations you let's think about the biggest one of all and one of the most leftists of all. The American Association for Retired People, the AARP. Think about all of the services that AARP offers. While you can get discounts on restaurants and rentals and 
uh, hotel rooms and and uh, if you're at Medicare or Medicaid age, you can get uh, your supplemental policies. You can there there is a plethora of services that they offer. Can you imagine the outcry if state governments or the federal government started coming down on the AARP, trying to destroy them, and trying to destroy them by saying to credit card companies? Medicare supplement companies, hotels that offer discounts, any number of things that you cannot offer those services or discounts because we're going to come after you because we're the attorney general of the state of Colorado or we're the attorney general of New York or we're the governor of New York or the governor of Colorado or the governor of California and we don't like your organization. So we're going to do everything we can to blacklist it by putting pressure on those organizations that you have outside agreements with to provide services and discounts to your members, we're going to threaten them and shut them down. We're going to put you in litigation. We're going to make you. We're going to cause you to spend millions of dollars in legal fees fighting the government that has billions of dollars. They have an unlimited amount of money to spend trying to destroy your your organization. That's what they're doing to the NRA. It's wrong. It's un-American. And in fact, I would say it's fascistic. It's communist. It's anti-American. The NRA has as much right to exist as the AARP or any other organization like that. And when the government comes down trying to stop them from being in existence, you should learn to fear your government. You should learn to fear the power of the government and what they can do to somebody like the NRA. Because mark my words, if they can do it to the NRA, they can do it to anyone. So on a lighter note, one of my favorite organizations, People for the uh, Eating Tasty Animals, PETA, well, actually, people for the ethical treatment of animals, has put up a billboard blaming the recent Midwest flooding on meat eaters. I don't know what they're smoking. They must have come to some dispensaries in Colorado, but they're at it again. This time, they put up new billboards in South Kansas City that show a cow deep in water with the words, Stop eating meat. They die for your cruel and dirty habit. Apparently, this pertains to the floodings that were around Kansas City and Apparently, that's obviously due to climate change, and PETA thinks that the world is suffering all these natural disasters because, well, we like to eat meat. In fact, I might just have a steak tonight. The PETA billboards are meant to pay homage to farm animals that were killed during the historic flooding across the Midwest last month. Well, actually, in March. Peter spokesper- uh, Peter, Peter. Peter spokesperson Amber Canavan said the animals were likely terrified while being swept away by flood water, just like they usually do when they take a trip to the slaughterhouse. You know, this shows what ignorance Peter has about exactly how animals are slaughtered. You know, I'm sure that the animals were, were actually scared to death when it came to the floods. If, if, if you're an animal and and you are being swept away by flood waters, of course your blood pressure is going to rise, your heart rate's going to rise, all of those things are going to happen, and the adrenaline that floods your body is is horrendous. That's not how most slaughterhouses work. There's a veterinarian up at Colorado State University, Dr. Grandin. She is, she has um, horrible autism, but she has managed to manage her autism, and she has written the definitive book on how slaughterhouses should operate, so that rather than just pushing all of the livestock out of the trucks into these huge pens, and then just shoving them down a chute, She designed a slaughterhouse um, layout that keeps the animals calm, cool, collected, so that as they go to the kill station, their heart rates are normal, 
blood pressure is normal, and they are killed instantly, humanely, and they never suffer. But PETA wouldn't know that. PETA thinks that every farm animal is treated with disrespect. You know, the other thing that bugs me about this PETA story, they've never been to a ranch. They've never been to a cattle ranch to see exactly how ranchers care and love for their livestock. Do you know why? Well, I mean, first of all, because ranchers love the environment. Ranchers love their animals. The ranchers know that that is their livelihood. And so the better care they take care of that livestock, the better price they can get for it. I'd encourage PETA. If you're a member of PETA, why don't you let me know? I'll take you to a ranch sometime. I'll let you see exactly how the animals are treated. Because when you talk about animals being stressed in a flood, you're right about that. But when you talk about animals being stressed on a ranch or a farm or or a slaughterhouse, you really don't know what you're talking about. Now, the Missouri Cattlemen's Association, along with a bunch of locals, called the billboard heartless and distasteful, which I happen to agree with. The organization executive vice president stated that farm and ranch families are at the mercy of the weather. And the fact is that natural disasters are often devastating, but they're unpredicted. The the Missouri Cattlemen's Association is exactly right. So if you have a ranch, I don't care whether it's 50 acres or 5,000 acres or, you know, a million acres. When a storm comes up and there's flash flooding, a natural disaster occurs, there's little, if anything, that you can do. But PETA thinks they know everything about it, so they put up billboards because they want to convince you somehow that farmers and ranchers don't care about, (laughs) about their animals. PETA is so stupid. But speaking of eating, I love this story. Disgusting, detestable gluttons rejoice. You may soon be able to gorge yourself on as many Funyun stuffed crust pizzas, Ben and Jerry. Well, I wouldn't eat Ben and Jerry's because they're a bunch of nut jobs. They got bought out. I forget who bought them out, but I still wouldn't buy Ben and Jerry's. Taco Bell quadruple decker deep fried quesaritos, and you can shove into your, as much as you can slove into your sloppy, dumb face hole with absolutely zero repercussions, just as God really never intended, but, well, all right. The story goes like this. An international team of scientists led by Associate Professor Beverly Rothermel at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and Professor Damian Keating at Flinders University think they may have a cure to our self-inflicted and well-deserved obesity by they have discovered a way to, to disable the RCAN1 gene. When that gene is disabled in mice, the animals are able to eat large quantities of high-fat foods as much as they want without gaining weight. You see, everybody that thinks the world's coming to an end, everybody, everybody thinks that we don't have solutions to our problems. We just need to give it time. There are scientists out there doing great studies. In fact, whether this study is, has been peer-reviewed or not, I don't care. It's becoming incre- increasingly clear that our only objective as a species, me included, is to somehow conquer the seven, seven deadly sins. Um. You know, we're getting close to finding a cure for herpes and AIDS. We're always on the hunt for a cure for a cancer. A friend of mine who has a chronic fatigue syndrome sent me, a, sent me an article out of, uh, I forget whether it was UC Berkeley or somewhere, about how they have been able to identify certain changes in brain matter that are a direct causation of chronic fatigue syndrome. And my friend who has chronic fatigue syndrome is ecstatic about this because it finally gives physicians a diagnostic tool to identify chronic fatigue syndrome. Many people think that chronic fatigue syndrome is just in the heads of people and they're just a, 
they're just tired, lazy, or suffering from depression or something else. And anything but there's that is so far from the truth. And now these doctors have come up with a way to identify certain brain activity that shows that, yes, there is a causation, there's a causal link between identifying this brain activity and chronic fatigue syndrome. So back to the doctors at uh, Southwestern Texas. Yes, if you can figure out a way to uh, change my RCAN1 gene so that I can meet as much Taco Bell as I want, man, oh, man. Have you made that's a Nobel Prize in scientific research? That's a Nobel Prize in medicine. That's a Nobel Prize that um, you get Taco Bell for life if that turns out to be the truth. Guantanamo Bay, when's the last time you heard any story about Gitmo? You know, that little piece of Cuba that we own where we have the naval base, Guantanamo Bay Naval Base. I find this story fascinating. The oldest man still held in military detention is now 71 years old. Most of the rest of them are in their 50s. And it's not clear how the government plans to care for these aging terrorists as they start to become eligible for AARP benefits. The 40 remaining prisoners at Guantanamo Bay Naval Base have the same physical ailments of any aging population hip replacements, eye surgeries, treatment for sleep apnea, mental health disorders, and probably eventually dementia and cancer. As the military commissions designed by the Bush Bush administration lurch unevenly towards convictions, a federal appeals court recently tossed aside three years of litigation in the USS Cole case. It appears increasingly likely that many of these old terrorists are going to grow old and die on the U.S. taxpayer's dime. Probably true. But why is this any different than a murderer that's on death row that ends up with AIDS or cancer or has sleep apnea or needs a eye surgery or has some sort of mental disorder or develops cancer? Why is this any different than someone in a U.S. prison? I think it's a this story comes to me from governmentexec.com. And I think what they're trying to do is they're just try, trying to figure out another way to uh, hammer on Guantanamo Bay and how bad it is and how we ought to uh, shut it down. I don't think we ought to shut it down. We should treat these aging terrorists just like we treat aging criminals that are in a penal system in the state of Colorado. Or take Supermax right here in Colorado where we've got the blind shake, where we've got the... Um, the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski's, where we have we have all of these horrible people just south of where I live. Not just south. I mean, probably, what, maybe 100 miles or so. But at Supermax, we have these people who are going to be there for the rest of their lives. They're going to develop cancer. They're going to develop problems. We're going to treat them. So why should Guantanamo Bay be any different? I think this is an example of not so much fake news as news with an agenda, trying to shut down Gitmo. We shouldn't shut down Gitmo any more than we should shoot any more than we should uh, shut down Supermax. You see, you got to pay attention to what you read and really think about what's the angle that they're pushing here. And speaking of getting old, should we really keep obsessing over how much sex we are or are not having? In a December 2018 cover story for The Atlantic, warning that Americans, millennials in particular, are having so little sex, senior editor Kate Julian soberly framed the drop as a sex recession. Now, there's a term to put in your vernacular, a sex recession. Drawing from a 2017 study, a psychology professor at San Diego State University They have highlighted evidence from a 2016 study at the University of Chicago. That survey found that millennials report having fewer sexual encounters on on average than the two generations before them. And millennials aren't the only cohort facing a decline. From the late 1990s to 2014, sex for all adults dropped from 62 to 54 times a year on average. 
54 times a year on average. Once a week. I don't know. Sounds kind of about right to me. (laughs) Oh, man. This is when I wish I had the text messaging services back because I'd like to find out from you. Uh, 54 times a year. True or false? The fear of a sex recession, though, is misdirected. A drop in sexual encounters from 62 to 54 times per year means the average adult is still having sex more than once a week. Now, current research suggests that having sex more than once a week does not have any positive impact on relationship satisfaction. Less than once a week can bring down satisfaction, but more sex does not necessarily improve it. According to this doctor, the amount of sex is a weak predictor of how satisfied you are with your sex life. And let me rephrase that for you. Not only are the concepts of quality and quantity distinct, but there's little relationship between those two variables. Now, the doctor that wrote the article says that the uh, recession metaphor is imperfect, imperfect. Really? No feces, Sherlock? Most people need jobs. That's not the case with relationships and sex. Nonetheless, sex is a critical factor in the health of any relationship. And research backs that up. You know, it's funny, the stuff I come across. Let's see. um, It turns out the silent generation was not necessarily having satisfying sex. In the oral histories I took from women in the 50s and 60s marriages, it was really clear that they were often giving a lot more sex than they felt like having. While much of the sex recession is being pinned on young people, I don't think that tells the full story. I guess... When I run across stories like that, I guess my question is, who cares? If you're happy, isn't that all that counts? If I'm happy, isn't that all that counts? How many times a year? If you're counting, maybe that's the problem. Hey, thanks for listening to this edition of Michael Brown Unplugged. I really appreciate all of you listening. Uh, As I always remind you, uh, you can go to uh, michaelbrowntoday.com. That's my website. And if you go to michaelbrowntoday.com, there's a place there for you to download the, the, the podcast from the Spreaker website. But you can also find us on Spotify. You can uh, follow me on all of the social media platforms. And I would really appreciate you doing that. So across the bottom of the homepage at michaelbrowntoday.com, you'll see the links for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, what am I leaving out? Oh, YouTube and and Vimeo. I really appreciate it if you would subscribe to the YouTube page. It's youtube.com slash Michael Brown today. I'd appreciate you liking us on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram, and I would certainly appreciate you uh, subscribing to the podcast. I'm I'm having fun doing this. I hope you're having fun listening to them. And I have one big favor to ask besides going to the website, michaelbrowntoday.com, and following me on on all the social media platforms and downloading, downloading the podcast. I would really like to hear from you. I would like to hear about what you think about the podcast. What do you like? What do you not like? I'm trying to do just about under 60 minutes for each one uh, because I think more than that is too long. Less than that's not enough. I'd like for you to tell me about the topics. I'd like for you to tell me just what you think about the podcast. So if you go to michaelbrowntoday.com, up there where it says book Michael, that's the contact page. You don't have to actually book me. It's a way to contact me. Send me an email. Tell me what you think. I I would really like to hear. So do that at michaelbrowntoday.com. Stay tuned, and we'll be back again tomorrow morning.